scripture for today, Psalms 115, verses 2 through 8. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is now their God? But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them. So is every one that trusts. Jonah chapter 2 verses 8 and 9. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for this, your word. Lord, we thank you that it is an ancient word, but yet it is as current as our uh, daily paper. So, Father, we ask that you would be with us as we share this time. And Lord, grant us open hearts, open minds, open spirits, Lord, that your spirit may speak to us uh, the words that you long for us to hear. Lord, help them not to be just audible words, but May they be spiritual words that are discerned spiritually. Father, hear our prayer. We ask in the name of Christ. Amen. One quick uh, reminder. Uh, I think it's in the bulletin. I didn't. Uh, I can't remember, but it's in the. It will be in the bulletin. Uh, this coming the end of this month, last Sunday of September, we're going to have a joint service. One service. No eleven. No eleven fifteen service. Just a 10 o'clock service, and then after that, we will have a fellowship meal. So uh, put, put that on your calendar, uh, put that on your calendars, and look forward to more information about the joint service last Sunday in September. So um, uh, I hope you'll make plans to be, a, to be a part of that. When, when you have sought spiritual guidance, or maybe someone has come to you asking for spiritual guidance, especially if someone comes and says, I don't sense the love of God, or I've struggled with the forgiveness of God, or, or I don't feel accepted by God. Or maybe you've not sought that counsel, but maybe those are questions that you have. What is generally the counsel that we receive regarding questions like that? There's one word that is included in most of the counsel that we receive, be it from a lay person or from a preacher. And it's generally something like this. You, you need more faith. The key word here is going to be more. You need to read your Bible more. Are these sounding familiar? You need to pray more. You need to give more. You need to get more involved. Usually the counsel regarding the spiritual struggles that we have include the word more. Jonah shatters that illusion. The text that we read this morning that Sylvia read for us, uh, Jonah chapter 2, verse uh, 8. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. We're just going to jump real deep at the very beginning. We're not going to wade in from the shallow end. We're jumping in the deep end of the pool here. If we lack assurance, if we lack an assurance of God's love, if we lack an assurance of, of God's forgiveness and, and all the attributes and qualities and benefits that are ours as followers of Christ, there are there's some credence to maybe we do not have enough faith. Maybe we're not in the word enough. Maybe we are neglecting worship. 
But I think we can neglect a very basic practical uh, thing that Jonah asserts here. And it's an idol. An idol. The, the Berean translation says, those who cling to worthless idols forsake his loving devotion. There might be a reason why we don't experience the fullness of God's love and grace to us. It could be that, that something has come into our lives that is blocking the flow or the presence of God's love and grace to us. It's not that God has forsaken us or God has removed his love from us, but Jonah says that we can forsake God's love. We can forsake his loving devotion. So, okay, what is an idol then? Um, uh, Tina helped us understand that a little bit. Here's the definition that I found. It's the worship of a cult image such as a statue or a person in place of God. So, the next couple of slides are going to be very practical. So I want you to pay attention to them really, really close because you're going to need to go home and search your home for these. These are some of the common idols why are you laughing? This is serious. These are, these are the Canaanite idols. They are like the idol of Baal and Asherah. So you really, we really need to go home and search our homes for these and clear out the places that we have set up where we bow and we worship and we pay homage to Asherah and Baal. Now, wasn't that a very helpful here, wasn't it? No, it's not at all. I don't know of anyone. I've never been in, well, I can't say that. I've never been in a house of a parishioner where they had uh, objects of Baal and Asherah where they had an altar set up. I've never seen that before. Idols are so much more subtle than that. We don't go online to Amazon's section of idols and order one. They sort of just creep into our lives. I love, if you have your Bibles, uh, look at Psalm chapter, uh, Psalm 115, verses uh, six, uh, uh, 5 through uh, 8. If you have sermon notes, you can follow along here. Uh, the, uh, the writer of Psalm 115, what idols are not, and, and their powerlessness. Notice what he says. I love this. Verse 5, they have mouths but can't speak. They have eyes, but can't see. They have ears, but they can't hear. Noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. Feet, but they cannot walk. Nor can they utter a sound with their throat. Idols are powerless. They're powerless except for the power and the authority that we give it to control our lives. Casey Lewis, a writer and blogger, has, has identified two types of idols. One is surface idols, and the other is source idols. Surface idols and source idols. Now, what are they? The first is uh, the ones that we think most commonly about or that probably popped in our mind, even though we may not have, have thought specifically what they might be, they're surface idols. It's things like power and position and titles and possessions, sex, money, homes, toys, spouses, children. All those things are surface idols. Think of things that are nouns that can become idols for us. Things that we, we bring in the, in the place of God is an idol. It's not little engraven statuettes that we, that we set up an altar before and burn candles and incense. That's not it. They're so much more subtle than that. Source idols, though, are, are the things, the needs within us that the surface idols seek to feed and fulfill. So it's, it's the power or, or the title, or money, or whatever it might be, that's the surface idol, but it really connects with something that is void and missing within myself, which is the source 
of the surface idol. We can remove the idols, but not deal with the source. Jonah speaks of, of, of idols. It, it, uh, his, his observation here to me seems like it comes out of nowhere. We're reading about him being thrown overboard. He's sinking to the bottom of the sea. And then here, right before he, right as his life is ebbing away from him in verse 7, he says, those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. What was Jonah's idol? Did he have a little bale hidden in his pocket? I don't think so. You know, I think, I wonder if, Jonah's idol had become God and his own religion. What I mean by that, Jonah was, a, was an Israelite, and he, and he knew the story is about God and his, and his deliverance of his people out of Egypt and, and the gift of the commandments and God choosing them to bless the whole world. Jonah knew about the kings and the prophets through which God spoke. And so Jonah had in, may have had in his mind certain criteria that, that met his expectations of who God is. And all those nice and neat theological premises and um, promises and uh, the sacrifices and all those things may have formed and fashioned God in his own mind to an image that when God said, go to Nineveh, Jonah was saying, no, that's not my God. We can do the same thing with our religion. We can do the same thing with our faith. We can have all the right beliefs, and we shape those into a spiritual house. And we stand back and we admire the beautiful spiritual house that we have created. But you know what? We never move into it. We believe that God is love and He's forgiving and He's merciful and gracious and kind, slow to anger, all those things but we never quite fully enter the house and enjoy living in the space. We just stand back and admire it because deep down we know that it's not safe because it's a creation of our own minds and our own thoughts. So therefore, we stand back and simply admire it. Had Jonah shaped God in his own image and his own understanding. So therefore, Jonah's faith, if Jonah's faith had become somewhat of an idol, it caused his faith to become idol. I-D-L-E. Powerless. We start our cars in the morning and we leave them in park for a few moments to warm up, at least we used to when we were young, and they would idle. They were running, but they're not going anywhere. It's full of gas and it started, but it's not in gear. Sadly, folks, I think we can come to the same place in our, in our faith that we have all the right beliefs and all the right practices and know all the right words, but it doesn't empower our lives. And so worship simply becomes idle worship, I-D-L-E, worship, which is a form of idol worship. Psalm 115, verse 8 says, Watch this. He, uh, the writer says, those who make them, who, those who make idols will be like them. And so will all who trust in them. If, if our worship is simply a dead, 
worship, if our faith is simply in promises written in black and white on a page, our faith lapses and become idle. And we simply become like that which we worship. We worship the true and living God who is alive within us. Has great things to show us and great things to do through us. But we just simply admire the spiritual house that he's created. So how do we put out into the deep? If we're not experiencing God's love, and there's, there's a lot of reasons why we might not experience God's love. It, it, it does not necessarily mean that we have an idol in our life. It's not that easy. There's a lot of things that can cause us to block and not understand and experience God's love. But I think it would, it would behoove us to consider this, that whatever has our money and our time has our heart. Whatever has my time, whatever has my money, that's generally where my heart goes. The question for us is, has that become my idol? The great apologist C.S. Lewis wrote the apologist's evening prayer. It's a little long, but it's a poem prayer. But I think it behooves us to read that. He writes, From all the lame defeats and oh, much more, From all the victories that, that I seem to score, From cleverness shot forth on thy behalf, At which, while angels wept, the audience laughed. From all my proofs of thy divinity, Thou, who wouldn't give no sign, deliver me. Thoughts are but coins. Let me not trust instead of thee their thin worn image of thy head. For from all my thoughts, even from my thoughts of thee, O thou fair silence, fall and set me free. The last part is just incredible. He says, Lord of the narrow gate and the needle's eye, take from me all my trumpetry, lest I die. 